four, I remember uh, Philip Candelas came back from Aspen and he was very excited because the anomaly cancellation made it. They found that anomalies canceled, it was a miracle that happened, that you, you had to solve some number of equations for fewer unknowns and you had equations and the answers had to be an integer. So it shouldn't have been true there were solutions, but there were. And so God exists and thinks that he's true. <laughs> so, so I didn't really understand why that was so convincing, but, but I did see that everybody else was learning string theory. And so when I got to take advantage of Bill Polchinski teaching himself string theory, he taught a class in it and Winder taught himself string theory in a very hands-on, pragmatic way of uh, learning it. And, um, and it turns out in the end that that, uh, that was probably the last time, that, that was the end of the era when particle physicists could afford not to learn any gravity because I think in the end of the day, the string theorists have introduced the language of quantum, uh, of general, of general covariance so much throughout particle physics that uh, really it's one of the, the basic tools that everybody uses. And, and uh, it was probably good to have learned it. Uh, it's good, I'm glad the revolution happened well, I was still a student, and it wasn't too late for me. Right? Now, the second revolution uh, was probably so. So, I learned some string theory, and as a postdoc, I did some string calculations. But I think the reason I don't count myself as a string theorist now is that I think I, I had decoupled from string theory by the time the second revolution came by, and the D range and all the dualities kicked in. And I think it's probably true that that's the barrier between me and uh, real honest to God card carrying string theorists. But I, I remember also. Uh, Bill Polchinski in the 80s coming uh, to give a talk and, 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 and over dinner or over lunch he was, he was uh, people were talking about you know, duality and p-duality and, and uh, what do you make of that? And, and the odd thing was that if you took a string and you did p-duality and you got some sort of a, a string where the boundary conditions at the end of the string were Dirichlet conditions, what, what could that mean? And so uh, no one knew and, and so that seemed like that was not such an interesting observation. But it uh, turns out that was kind of the observation that led to the brain. And, and from my point of view, the, what was, uh, I guess, the, the thing that was great about the brains was um, that for me, I'm kind of mostly interested in, in string theory for the ideas it gives, uh, can help us with hierarchy problems or problems of in, in naturalness problems in particle theory and in cosmology. And the brains have been a gold mine for that. And they, they really have uh, changed the way you think about. It really had changed the way you think about low energy physics because it's not so much that they um, uh, they do things that haven't been, hadn't been thought about before, but they gave a real respectability to ideas that had been around before, such as uh, this picture that, that every particle we know could be uh, trapped on a surface. And, and so there, was now, there were now two, re two ways in which you could avoid learning about X dimensions. It could have been the old, the old reasons why X dimensions could be there not have been discovered is that they could have been small. But now another reason was that it could be that the things you look for them with are stuck on some surface and can't get off that surface. And that was a, an idea that had been actually put forward a number of times in the past, uh, including I think by Lukakov in the early 80s, but no one really took it very seriously. But, but one of the things that the D-brain revolution accomplished for the rest of us was it really showed that here's a very well-motivated theory of what's going on at small distances and it makes it very plausible that things could be stuck on surfaces. And, and you should think that through carefully because that could change what you think is natural about uh, the low energy limit of, uh, of a theory. And in particular, what it did is it, it, uh, it allowed, it, 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 it decoupled the string scale from the Planck scale. And before the brain came around, everybody was sure that the string scale was up to the Planck scale. It was very, very hard to test the string theory because the string scale was so high. And uh, the realization that uh, things could be trapped on a surface, and in particular interactions, could see different dimensions. So it might be true that electromagnetism sees four dimensions, while gravity sees ten. Uh, freed up the possibility that strings could be at any length, and so that was a parameter new problem as to what the gravity scale was fundamentally. And that's 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 amazing because if you one of in in essence the naturalist problems that you hit. Uh, can be phrased in, in kind of a stupid way. If you, if you, if you have, is it, is it chalky up there? Yeah. One of the reasons you do so so well with uh, lowering the gravity scale is that if, you know the way somebody would have said that there's a problem, say, uh, 
having light scalars, even if they're very weakly interacting, would have been that if you calculate some sort of a graph where you're looking at the corrections of some heavy particle to uh, a light particle, say this is a scalar, then the answer, even if the interactions are very weak, so even if the interactions are gravitational in strength, you might imagine there's a, there's a one over m Planck that you have to pay for every time you have a vertex. But a graph like this would have given a change to the mass squared, which is of the order of you know, the integral of v4p over 2 pi to the fourth for the loop. Um, I guess there's a one over p's running around for the propagators, let's say one over p squared squared. And for gravity, there's probably p's in the, in the, in the, uh, in the interactions, so I might be a p of the fourth or so. And there's a one over m Planck squared for the two interactions. If I've done that right, this is dimensions of mass squared, which it does. And so now the, the way you would have thought about this in the early 80s would be that you'd say that, well, there are things running, here, running around here that are at the Planck scale. And so in the end of the day, this is 1 over m Planck squared times something to the fourth power. And it's going to be m Planck to the fourth power, because that's the biggest scale in the problem. And so you're getting Planck scale corrections from very, very weak interactions. But once you recognize that the gravity scale could be much lower than the Planck scale, same argument takes you to whatever that scale is, and you get something here in the numerator which is smaller than the Planck scale. And so now these are all small things rather than big things. And so you have to go back and rethink all the things that you thought were big because they needn't to be big because before you got to the bad place, string theory rides in and saves you. And so uh, it was really a, a, a radical thing that uh, changes a lot of the ways we think about low energy physics, and I think in a way we haven't exhausted completely yet. I think it's also spawn the spawning of ADS CFT has got to be the deepest thing I've ever seen. That's the one thing I think in theoretical physics that I could you, you did not see coming. It's one of those things when you know, you're not you, you, you kind of took your eye off the string theorists for a couple of years and they came back and they said, turns out that uh, the gauge theories are the same thing as gravity theories. And, you, you, and, and of course, the first time you hear that, you think, yeah, right. <laughs> but it, uh, it, it, it's, it's really, it's a remarkable thing. The, 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 it could be that, that ultimately string theory has nothing to do with the theory of quantum gravity. It might be that, uh, you know, if, if every string theorist got hit by a bus tomorrow, God forbid, they still have done something useful. It might be that 100 years from now, the only people that know string theory are the condensed matter physicists and the nuclear physicists. So they, they, that would be God's irony. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> But it's, it's uh, you know, the, the, in essence, the string theorists have told us that there are fewer field theories in the world than we thought. And quantum field theories are the language with which we describe nature. And we're digging through them, trying to find what's going on. And now, that we, now, now we know that there's not as many different ones as we thought they were, that, that theory A and theory B are really the same theory written in different ways. And that, that's kind of a remarkably deep insight. And, uh, and it's nowhere near explored to the end, and, and so probably that's the most useful thing that's come out of string theory. I think it's something which, independent of how successful it is at describing quantum gravity, which I'm optimistic that we will be good at describing quantum gravity, but it's, uh, it's, it's really amazing to have, uh, to see condensed matter physicists talking to string theorists and having something useful to say to each other. That's something which uh, I, I did not see that coming. <laughs> so, so anyway, thanks for the chance to, to talk about all time. Q&A and, uh, you know, like, it's not even a panel discussion, it's meant to be for audience if you have with the, 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 the speaker in front. So I would, I would, I would like, invite, uh, basically, the two speakers, and uh, uh, just, oh, and Brian, and uh, also, um, uh, Damien and Bonnie, you know? Yeah, we have, like, six people. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need six people to sit six chairs in the front. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
No, I don't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, questions? Like, some questions about, you know, just a description to the I don't know if it was sparked by the by the the observation that uh, uh, in a way uh, the, after the discovery of QCD, I mean, people thought that I mean we still know that uh, theory of flux cubes in QCD uh, should be described by some kind of string theory. People thought that string theory lived in four dimensions as QCD does. We have now learned that uh, it doesn't live in four dimensions, it lives in higher dimensions, which also explains why that flux cube is thick and not thin. I mean, a thin string in higher dimensions when projected uh, becomes a thick string in four dimensions. Uh, and I think it, it, it is significant that there is actually a mathematically precise formulation of the confinement problem uh, in terms of uh, fundamental string theory. The unfortunate fact is that uh, you really need to know that string theory in a background of some D4 brains with compact directions and so on and so forth. But it is still true that if you are able to even understand classical string theory in those backgrounds, you will learn a lot about the spectrum and properties of large electricity real QCD, no supersymmetry, you know, nothing else, just, just QCD as we know it. And I think that will be tremendous progress because uh, if, if uh, we can really do this. There, 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 I cannot figure out whether the, uh, the obstruction about knowing that string theory is technical or conceptual, I don't know. I mean, clearly one aspect is that uh, even, even supersymmetric backgrounds like ADS5 cross S5, you know, the, the fact that we don't quite know how to do string theory in Ramon Ramon backgrounds, I think it's it's uh, it's significant. But of course, we have to go out of supersymmetry to, <coughs> to do that. Uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, whether it's, that's why I said that supersymmetry is like a shackle, I mean, it sort of holds us down. And we, we think in terms of that, you know, because we made a huge progress in terms of that, but uh, other tools have, haven't been developed. So that's one of the examples I thought would be. We, we, we lack, for example, to understand the uh, string theory in cosmological backgrounds. I think uh, we, we, don't, we don't know I mean, <laughs> very much about it. And I think, uh, you know, uh, if, if you really think about uh, the landscape problem and if you think about what, uh, whether we can still make progress out of uh, in, this, in, this, in this confusion, I mean, maybe the understanding is cosmology, that, uh, that in a cosmological background, uh, the, the the usual plethora of things which we talk about. The questions are different in time-dependent cosmological, and we have no no inkling about how to do that. So basically, you are, you are, uh, basically you mean like the, the application of the string theory, and you try to construct that, but uh, you do not mean that the uh, formalism of string theory itself, right? Uh, there could be something in the formalism in string theory. I mean, if you look at what, uh, why, can calculate things with string theory is uh, just writing down string theory doesn't that much depend on supersymmetry. But the fact that there are infrared problems if you don't have supersymmetry, the fact that you know the, the modular integrals uh, diverge at imaginary tau very large, you know that that is uh, I think that is a fundamental issue with supersymmetry solves, right? So <laughs> so I don't know. I mean that could be something fundamental in there. A priori doesn't look like it needs supersymmetry to write string theory. Okay, okay I have one. So, uh, so, let me just mention about application of string theory like classical. So, I want to ask the, I guess the panelists, uh, what is uh, the, what's the most valuable thing string theory actually buys you? Like research wise? Well, uh, the 
hands of his mic, so I have to speak. <laughs> <laughs> he went to close his phone. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, speaking personally, uh, uh, it kept me engaged and uh, finding interesting to do. Uh, in a way, among people here, I, I was uh, engaged in the minus two, two <laughs> spring revolution. And I've seen how things evolve and a lot of surprises. So in some sense, you have to keep an open mind on what might happen. But yet, you have to have some belief in, in what you want to do, what is interesting to you. You keep plugging at it. So in some sense, uh, I am still doing some of the problem I did when I was a graduate student and, the, and the one just going like this initial minus two string theory develop and develop. I know all the people who started the whole work I keep on learning from them, I keep on finding out that the new concept which I initially thought was either ridiculous or impossible turned out to be uh, interesting and uh, properly interpreted, uh, they are correct. And then when, whenever something happens, you come back to a problem you have not been able to solve in the early days, then uh, you realize it can be interesting again. So, so just speaking for myself, uh, when I was a graduate student in this, I was interested in the very fact that the scattering total cross-section are nearly constant or increasing gradually. And that's the kind of thing everybody from Ben Ziano, John Schwartz, Mike Green, everybody were interested. And uh, led to the original string theory and uh, until people realized that uh, had a massive graviton in the theory, so everybody gave up, except John Schwartz and others stayed with it. And uh, it could no longer be QCD, but uh, it's led to string theory of, of gravity. But yet, the whole idea of string theory was described strong interaction still makes sense. So we always hoped someday there would be a string theory which uh, removes this massive particle in there to describe QCD. And uh, it was not until when ABCFT came along after the second revolution, you have to wait a long time to be able to understand this kind of question. And uh, you know, we find the role of gravity, graviton, within the concept of QCD. So, so speaking for myself, personally, that's the most uh, gratifying thing. But uh, uh, in some sense, uh, we never give up. And uh, things happen, and uh, surprises happen. And uh, even people like John Schwartz, Mike Green, uh, John always wanted to pursue this from the very beginning. Mike, I actually did not, because I met him in 82 or 83, 82. Now, I'm going to do critical phenomena, I'm giving up on particle physics. Mm -hmm. So in 84, I left Aspen, I, I arrived one day early. I didn't have a place to stay, so I called John. John says, well, come over, Mike is staying with me. And uh, we talked, and they're talking about this crazy thing you're doing. And I, I didn't even pay attention during the summer. And the next thing I know that they have a revolution going. <laughs> and this happens, and we just have to do what's interesting, but yet uh, hoping that, uh, not hoping, believing things that uh, make sense to you, and uh, some gratifying as well. Yeah, because Michael the advisor was also kind of English English version counterpart of the Jeffrey Chu, right? Which is well, I mean, I, I, and I, Michael, I, Michael did PhD in particular force theory, I remember he was. Uh, I, can I can tell you a little bit more. He, uh, his advisor was Richard Eden. Yeah. Richard Eden, before Mike did finish his PhD, he spent a summer at Berkeley. Okay. So Richard and I worked together. So Mike actually wrote his thesis on something we did, uh, extending from things we did, okay. and uh, maybe something in string theory, and then by 
early 80s, he was about to give up. And so, um, in fact, he did work on, he was going to get into critical phenomena because uh, the master still a postdoctor. No, no, he was. He, he was. Uh, yeah, he had this five year of thing. Yeah, in UK. And uh, he was. Uh, he got into critical phenomena because he was trying to solve their problem, which is this thing John Carty was working at the time. So for Red Jam Theater there. So there they learned the critical phenomena technique of the thing. That's when I explained to him. I remember it was this like six dimension. So he was about to give up on particle physics. And Peter Jack got him into back into the initial career in the spin theory. And so that's what it happens. So the question is what the string theory, what the, what's it done yeah, for? Yeah, I was, I was actually, I think, okay, if I were to pick down my question a little bit, it was like more like what the string theory buy for you, like what you saw was most valuable. Yeah. But I guess Chongyi also gave a very nice story. Um, yeah. I think it's a, it's a great generator of ideas. It's uh, it, it's you know, the rest of us sit around and every ten years there's a there's a revolution and, and, and now we're overdue. So you guys need to get on it. But, <laughs> but it's uh, it's been very valuable as a source of ideas for cosmology and for particle physics. It's, uh, and, and and it's kind of an interesting sociological study because normally if you have a theoretical field that doesn't have experimental uh, help. It, 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 it flounders, and and, there, and people still leave it because they they can't make progress on problems, mm -hmm. so then they they don't go anywhere. It's kind of interesting that that has not happened in string theory. That the, that there's something in the structure of the theory which seems to give people guidance, and so it takes them to new ideas in a way, uh, which is kind of probably unprecedented, uh, given that there's not an experimental guidance to helping to point the way. Uh, oh. I'm not actually a string theorist, so um, I'm, I'm not sure I can really answer the question as to what string theory does for me quite, quite directly. And Cliff and I have, have kind of a, a view on this that um, the, the area of CFT correspondence, the quantum long effect, is a place to look for, um, for, for connections with kinetic matter. But it, um, in, for continuity in the question, maybe I'll hand over to, to Pango okay. first, because I have something I'd like to ask some of the other panelists, and it may be better if, if yeah, it was actually Pango. Pango. Okay, um, well, for me, um, string theory gives me my job. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was doing my PhD, I, my Professor Zumino, he, he told me to study string theory, although I wasn't, that wasn't my thesis. Um, but when I was graduating, um, he told me, now it's time to do string theory, or you won't get a job. So I followed his advice and <laughs> at the right time, so I... That was 1996. Um, so um, also for me, I think string theory is a, is a good place to look for ideas, like Cliff was saying. Um, I always wondered, for example, um, our notion of space-time. Um, what is space? Why, why do we care so much about the notion of distance? You know, why is the universe you know, uh, described by geometry of Riemannian geometry rather than complex geometry or other types of geometry? And string theory gives you a um, notion about space-time, not, not like in other theories in which you put in by hand your notion about space-time, but you discover from the theory what space-time should be about, how you define it. Um, and also, like many other developments um, about relations among uh, gauge theory or gravity or quantum theory, you could, in principle, discover these connections without string theory. But um, most of the time, we realize these connections from string theory, from studying string theory. So I think that's that's a um, very important role played by string theory, even if we don't believe. Although I can't see any reason why you won't believe in string theory. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, you have a question for other panelists? Yeah, as I say, I, I'm not a string theorist, but uh, um, I, I, I do remember the, the first. Um, String revolution. I remember when uh, when I was a student making making my green at a uh, a meeting in England, and, and I was sitting over the table from him for the evening meal. And I, I I didn't know who he was. I asked him what he was doing, and and he explained to me that um, he was working on this string theory stuff. And like Cliff, uh, I, my immediate reaction was, "Oh, well, that's all very interesting, but I don't have to pay any attention to that." <laughs> uh, 
Um, and then a few years later, I was, um, I was a postdoc at Glasgow, and we were organizing a summer school. And John Schwartz um, was coming to, and this was just after they discovered the anomaly translation. And he was um, describing string theory. And I remember him being, I, I think the word is frustrated. He was, he was very frustrated that there were five string theories. Um, at the time, I mean, they had the heterotic, the T A cross C, the Nestle property 2, type 2A and type 2B. And, and he wanted it to be one, because he wanted this to, be, to lead him to, to a unique theory of, of gravity, quantum gravity. And, um, and Sumit has, has described how we're now in a situation where the, the landscape and the 10 to 500 vacuum or whatever, that, um, it's, this is not going to go away. This, this, is, um, this is here to stay. And many string theorists seem to perceive this as a problem, but I wonder, um, and this is a question I want to put to the, the string theorists here, um, a, well, a point of view, and, and to, see, to get their opinions on it. Um, if, if you, one, one of the places where string theory has had um, a huge impact, I think, is, is in mathematics and differential geometry. If you, if you think of string theory as being um, a branch of mathematics, rather than a physical theory, then I, I think the problem just goes away. I mean, no, no one, no one would ever ask if, if um, is complex math analysis the theory of physics. It, it, it's not a sensible question. So, if you think of string theory as, as, as mathematics, then asking is string theory the theory of physics is, is perhaps not a sensible question. If you have ten to the five hundred vacua, then use them. If, if this is, if you think of this as being a mathematical tool that could be applied to many different areas of physics. <coughs> Then the, the problem just just goes away. So I wonder what the what the, the string theorists in the panel would would, would um, say to that. The point of view. Uh, I, I, <coughs> I should actually relate something personal in this. Uh, uh, I did my PhD in large and gauge theories, and I uh, started doing Monte Carlo simulations of large gauge theories in really rapid programs and. You know, trying to calculate theories and gauge theories, and then anomaly cancellation came, and you know, it was abundantly clear that string theory describes some theory of gravity. Maybe there may not be the gravity of our world or some, but you know, it does give rise to Einstein equations, and it, it was just amazing. I mean, this calculation that uh, if you take a string with a non trivial background, and require consistency of the string theory, Einstein equations follow. I think for me, it was really amazing. So I, mean, I just gave up everything, threw out all my computer programs, and started <laughs> literally like that. And then I uh, got a postdoc in Caltech, which was like the, the Mecca of string theory at that time. John Schwartz finally got a job there. <laughs> 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 and uh, a bus doctor I arrived there, Feynman, one day just walked into my office and said, so what do you work on? So you, I was a new postdoc in that group, but we haven't really met, but so I was very excited. Uh, I, I told Feynman that uh, I'm working on string theory, and he said, so why do you want to work on string theory? So he was very, uh, he was known to be very skeptical of string theory, and he said, well, you know, you can, you know, you can calculate the ratio of the mass of the proton to the mass of the pion. I mean, if you, if you know string theory, and you can calculate the power couplings, and you can, uh, you know, get all that spiel about, you know, <laughs> you know, and all that. And he listened to me very quietly, and then he, he said, do you really believe that you can discover nature without clues from nature? And so I think what he meant is he didn't really believe this is all serious.